And when Europe had heard that their holy lands had been taken from them, really, Europe went to blaze. Pope Urban II died out of grief. And I say, Subhanallah Salahuddin, you broke the backs of tyrants thousands of miles away. And then the subsequent Pope wrote a letter to all the kings that they should send every able person to fight. Richard, Philip, they bought 600,000 men. And Salahuddin was amazed at the zeal of Christendom. He wrote letters to all the Muslim leaders. Nobody obliged. And 600,000 crusaders camped at Acre. And what they did is that they made trenches around them and then they barricaded themselves in. So Salahuddin Rahmatullah couldn't attack them from behind. And for two years, Salahuddin remained in the field. And Salahuddin wasn't just a warrior. Ibn Shaddad mentions, and he accompanied Salahuddin for years. He says, Salahuddin for years never missed Salah with Jamaat. He didn't live next to the Jami Masjid. He didn't live in a palace. He lived on a tent in the battlefield. One night before the battle, he was inspecting his men. And the Hajjud time, they were sleeping. And the definition of the Sahaba was what? They were men who would pray at night and be on their horsebacks during the day. And at the Hajjud time, these people were sleeping. And Salahuddin said, wake up, wake up. For you people will make us lose the battle. Because he wanted his men to be like the Sahaba. And we can't wake up for Fajr. And we talk about victory. When we see the suffering of our Muslim brothers and sisters, we can't put our hands in our pockets. And we can't even give our zakat. And we're talking about victory. When it's Hajj time, we're not ready yet. But we want Allah to be ready to assist us. Since when did you become Allah and Allah become your servant? And Ibn Shaddad rahmatullah says, Salahuddin, he would cry at the apathy of the Muslim leaders. By Allah, we cry at the apathy of the Muslim leaders today. All those problems which existed in the time of Salahuddin, all exist today. The only thing difference is that there is no Salahuddin to bring the Ummah together. There were three Khalifs in the time of Salahuddin. Does anybody know the name of any one of those Khalifs? But history remembers Salahuddin because he cared. When they lived in their palaces, where did Salahuddin live? He lived in a tent. Ibn Shaddad rahmatullah mentioned, he said, one night I saw Salahuddin. He couldn't sleep the whole night. He was in so much pain. The whole night he was tossing and turning. But morning came. At the crack of dawn, Salahuddin mounted his horse and he did not descend until sunset. When others had big meals in their palaces, Ibn Shaddad mentioned for three days, Salahuddin ate nothing. When others lived with their families in their palaces, Salahuddin was on the battlefield. He was dodging arrows. Ibn Shaddad mentioned that one day the news came that Salahuddin's brother had passed away. Then his nephew had passed away and he began to cry. And we didn't know why he was crying, but we began to cry with him. But he says, then Salahuddin rahmatullah went on the battlefield and it was as though nothing had happened. Finally, the crusaders after two years, the Muslims in Acre asked for terms. Richard gave them two terms. And then after that, he butchered every man, woman and child in Acre. And then they marched by the coast and they came to Jerusalem. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah took an oath, allegiance upon death from his men upon the rock. Ibn Shaddad mentioned that when Jerusalem was besieged, Salahuddin wouldn't sleep all night. He would beg him to sleep. He wouldn't sleep because his love for the holy lands was past any imagination. And Ibn Shaddad says, I met him at Fajr. He hadn't slept all night. And I said, oh Salahuddin, it is a holy day. It's Friday. Why don't you give some sadaqah secretly and then at Jummah between the Adhan and the Kama pray two rakats and ask Allah for assistance. And he mentions that day I was sitting next to Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi and he prayed the two rakats and then he began to cry and he was making dua. He was saying, he said, Oh Allah, all my own resources I have exhausted in assisting your deen. And the only thing I have left is that I turn to you and I hold on to your rope. And I ask you for your fadl and your grace. And Ibn Shaddad mentioned, I saw Salahuddin cry until his beard became drenched. And then the mat in front of him became wet. He cried and he cried. The next morning the news came that the crusaders had lifted their siege. 
And Richard had said his famous statement, as long as a man like Salahuddin is protecting Jerusalem, you will never take it. And then it was Richard who asked for a truce. Salahuddin never asked for a truce. Salahuddin didn't want a truce. The truce took place and Balian said in the awe of Salahuddin, he said, Oh Salahuddin, you have achieved something in Islam that nobody before you has achieved. He said 600,000 crusaders came and only one in 10 returned. Some died out of natural causes, some drowned, but he said the vast majority of Salahuddin you killed. And it was almost as though Allah had kept Salahuddin alive just for that period. After the truce, Salahuddin went back to Damascus. And the narration mentioned that one wet day he went to visit the Hajis. And when he came back, it was cold, it's wet. He became ill. And every day his state got worse. And Ali Maad mentioned, I was with Salahuddin when he was ill. By Allah, every time Salahuddin became more ill, it was as though his trust in the Rahm of Allah just increased. He said the weaker his body got, the stronger his trust in Allah became. And even in that state, Salahuddin couldn't go to the masjid anymore. But he insisted on praying Salah with Jama'ah. And they would bring an Imam, they would help him up and he would pray Salah in Jama'ah. And Shaykh Jafar mentioned that I was reciting the Quran by his bed. And when I reached the verses, Wallahu la ilaha illahu. He, it is Allah and no Lord besides Him, the knower of the unseen. He said, Salahuddin had been unconscious for a while, and I heard a faint voice saying, Sahih, you have spoken the truth. And he mentioned, For three days I recited the Quran by the bed of Salahuddin. And he said, On the final day when he passed away, I reached the verse, La ilaha illahu alayhi tawakkaltu. There is no God but Allah and upon Him I trust. And I saw Salahuddin's face become radiant and he recited the Shahada and he left this dunya. And Ibn Shaddad mentioned that this was the greatest calamity to befall the Muslims since the demise of the Khulafai Rashidun. And Abdul Latif, the famous physician says that he was mourned like a prophet because everybody loved him. The good loved him, the bad loved him, the Muslims loved him, the non-Muslims loved him. Everybody loved Salahuddin. And what did this king leave behind him? King of Egypt, king of Syria, Lebanon, Yemen. What did he leave behind him? He left one dinar and 47 dirhams, some armor and a horse. This is all he left behind him. They had to borrow money for his janazah. But I'll tell you what he left behind him. He left a legacy behind him. If the Shaddad was the closest man to Salahuddin Rahmatullah he was the biographer of Salahuddin. The day Salahuddin Rahmatullah passed away was the day that he finished the biography of Salahuddin. He mentioned that one day I was traveling with Salahuddin and Salahuddin turned to me and he said, Oh Ibn Shaddad, there are people in the dunya to whom dust and wealth is the same. And Ibn Shaddad said, I knew that he was speaking about himself because he didn't care about the dunya. And how was Salahuddin buried? They had to borrow money for his janazah. And Qadi Fadil gave a fatwa that Salahuddin should be buried with his sword. So that on the day of judgment when he's resurrected and one of the seven people who is under the shade of Allah is Imamun Adilun, a just ruler. When he's under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is leaning upon his sword. So everybody sees that this is the liberator of the holy land. This was the man who flung open the gates of fortresses and castles of the Christians, one after the other. And on his tomb they wrote, O oh Allah, as his final victory, open for him the gates of Jannah.